I'm in a series um, finishing today uh, on 1 Corinthians 13, 13, which says, now, I rem- now abide these three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these, the most impactful of these, the things that just open up our eyes, the things that will live forever, the things that none of us have a full grasp or appreciation of. And I firmly believe that when we've been in heaven a hundred years or a thousand years or 10,000 years or 10 trillion years, I don't think we're ever going to have a full grasp of the love of God that he has given. I think throughout all of eternity, we're going to have a greater appreciation. Now, I will tell you, when I breathe my last breath and I, I, I'm in the presence of God, I'm going to say glory because it is going to be so good. Amen? But I think after a few moments, I'm going to go, wow. And I know time doesn't exist there, but after we've been there a while, I'm going to go, wow. Right? And, and, and somebody like Moses is going to come up and say, I've been waiting to hug your neck, and I'm going to go, wow. Y'all know what I mean? And even greater, somebody's going to come up to me and say, I've been waiting for you, and I'm going to say, really? I got a grandfather I'm waiting to see. Y'all got any loved ones on the other side? I, 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 got, I got a someone so very dear and special to me that I'm going to see on the other side. I, I, I have been in a moment the last, it started in June, but there's been this of one close friend passing and the next close friend passing and the next close friend passing and and, and Friday, I did the, the, the death of my fifth since June of a, somebody that I led into the inner brine. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And, and can I just say, y'all take care of yourself. I don't know if I can take too much more of it. Now, everybody tries to assure my soul, and I'm like, they're like, I, I, I know. Heaven's a good place to be, right? It still doesn't mean that there's not loss here on earth. That's why God gave us the gift of grieving. We have to grieve the lost, and it's because they meant so much to us. But when we get to heaven, there will be no more grieving. There will be no more goodbyes. There will be no more heartache. There will be no more tears. There will be no more longing for that which we can't reach. (laughs) It will be our faith becoming sight, the anchor of our soul, our hope, will now be in full existence. That thing that we ignite in our life today, that thing that keeps us on the journey, that keeps us with the upward look, that thing that sings in our heart, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting a a pre-taste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation. It was purchased by God. I have been born of his spirit, and I have been lost in his love. That is my story. It is my song. I am so grateful for the faith that we find, that we hold to, that I might not see it yet, but I know it's real. That everything else in this world may speak a different story, but yet there's an anchor in our soul that holds us to the the very thing of God. Faith is when we see who all God is, though our eyes are blind by the world, but yet faith gives us a glimpse. And our faith releases all, can I say it again? 
all of the Holy Spirit to release God's best within us. It wouldn't happen if we didn't have that faith of holding on to God. Hope, the anchor, living hope, it's alive in our life. It means to anticipate with the greatest of expectation, to have confidence in Abraham. Just so I'm not picking on just some people, at 75 years old, heard a word from God who said, leave everything that you've ever known, that you've ever held for, that you've ever grown, all the security of everything that you have, leave it behind because I have a place that I have for you called the promised land. Anybody in here know about the promised land? Where we leave everything else behind and we start a journey towards the promised land? At 75 was a good time to get that journey started for Abraham. And yet, there was parts of the promise that he didn't really know or or didn't really understand, but yet he held to. And at 100 years of age and his wife 90 years of age, he had a son. Can you imagine the first time he held that boy in those hundred-year-old wrinkled hands and he kissed that brow and he knew God's promises were faithful and true? But what about when he was 112 years old, when God told him to take that son, his only son? He wasn't counting Ishmael. He was counting the, the child of promise, for the child of his Sarah, to take him down to Mount Sinai and, and take a, go up Mount Sinai and build an altar there and then take your son and lay him on the, offer, off the altar and offer him to God because God doesn't want second best. He wants to be first place in her heart. And Abraham was willing by faith and by hope. I love what Romans chapter 4 verse 18 says about that. It says, contrary to hope, in hope believed. I know if he had that conversation with his wife, honey, I'm going going to take Isaac. We're going to go on a trip. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, we're going to go down to the desert. We're going to go to Mount Sinai. Oh, that, that'll be good. Teach him some things down there. He's a man now. He's 12 years old. Well, what I plan on doing is taking him up to the mountain. I'm going to build an altar there. Oh, teach him to worship. And I'm going to take my boy and bind his hands and lay him on that altar. Oh, no, you're not. Yes, God told me to do this. Oh, no, he did not. That's why I know he never had that conversation. Because if he, t- if he did, it would have been with Sarah holding on by his ankles. You're not taking my boy. But praise God. Contrary to hope, Romans 8, 4, 18 says. Contrary to hope, in hope believed. Contrary to what you think, contrary to what the world says, contrary to your emotions and your feelings, contrary to the greatest knowledge of this world, con- contrary to the, uh, all the things that you think, Christ is still on throne. He's still in charge. And he still loves you with an everlasting love. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. And he will not take you any place. Did you hear me now? He will not lead you any place that's not good, right, best. I feel so honored to be here today. I feel so honored to be able to preach today on the love of God. Can I, can I go ahead and disappoint you? I'm not going to give you an exhaustive message on love. I can't. I can give you Brian's viewpoint for today. I can give you a small example of what God would, has placed upon my heart because if it, how many of you know that if, if, if I stayed here all day and all night and used all the great words that I have, I still could not describe the love of God. But yet, can we take a moment and pause and look to the love of God? A love that is so great. 
And the verse that I want to begin with is the one the choir just sang about. How many of you, that was the very first verse that you memorized was John 3, 16? For God so loved even somebody like me and somebody like you that he gave, didn't have to, his only the apple of his eye, the one that he cherished and valued the most, the most valuable thing in all of eternity. He freely gave his son. Why? That whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have, oh, praise God for life. Not like the one that I have now where I'm just breathing. I know I can tell you a lot of people who are breathing that are miserable, right? That have lost hope. That, that can't even begin to describe faith of something. No, they're just, they're just miserable. But, but he came to, to take that life, like he told Nicodemus, you must be born again to have a new life. The word again there means from above. Everlasting life. Life to the fullest, my word. Life to the uttermost. God's best. Have you ever questioned God when he said his best? Have you ever said, Lord, you need to look around. This can't be your best. How many of you know that you are the apple of God's eye? Because he loved, he gave. Never selfishly. And the benefit of it was us. I'm going to say this once again. My favorite part of John 3.16 is not that he lie, loved, but that he so loved. Y'all know what I mean by that? Oh, some, sometimes people will say, I, I, I love you. But God says, I so loved you. I have opened up all the treasuries of heaven. And you have full access can I say it Brian's way? I'm going to bless your socks off. I'm going to knock you down with love. I'll be behind every corner there for you when you're just walking around and I'm just going to jump out and say, I love you. God ever do that for you? I mean, you're just walking through your life and you're just doing things and you're just, and he, all of a sudden he jumps out and says, I love you. And we go, oh, I know, Lord. No, we don't. We say, thank you, Lord. John 15, verse 9 says this. As the Father, this is Jesus speaking. He says, as the Father loved me. How many of you know God loved him with an everlasting love? He said, I also have loved you. And then he uses this word, abide in my love. It means to stay. It means to tarry. It means to remain. It means to continue to be present in his love. Don't leave. Don't walk away. Don't get distracted. Anybody in here get distracted? <clears throat> in verse 12, he says, this is my commandment. For our benefit, it's not like he's going to ask us to do something that's against us. He says, this is so important. I'm going to tell you, whether you feel like it or not, I command you to do this. Love one another. Anybody ever had trouble loving somebody else? Anybody ever want to say, Lord, 
Thank you for all the wonderful people that you've surrounded me with that it's so easy to love. I just thank you for those friends and those, I thank you for those, but those other people, Lord, what in the world were you thinking about? Woo, man, were you asleep that day? I mean, good gosh, why are they here? Would you smite them, O oh Lord? Send fire from heaven and consume them. How many of y'all prayed fire from heaven? Don't act so holy, I know you. Right? You remember the disciples were around Jesus and they're over there and they're talking bad about him. And, and he's like, Lord, let's just call fire out of heaven. And Jesus is like, Hush, I love them as much as I love you. Love one another. Can y'all look up here? Is that hard? Uh, is it difficult? Hold on, hold on. Sometimes would you admit that it's impossible? Feels like it, doesn't it? But is it impossible? In that time is the time that God lets his love shine in an amazing, amazing, and amazing, and amazing way. That's why it's a commandment. We must not only love God, we must love each other in the same way. Did y'all get that? In the same way. As God gave the most valuable thing that he had for us, should we give to others that love in like manner? How many of you were dirty, rotten sinners? Right? How many of you did not deserve that love? But are you willing to give to someone else? the way God gave to you? Are you waiting for them to come and get their life straightened out and apologize to you for all the evil that they've done to you before you love them? While we were yet sinners, Romans 5 verse 6 says this, for when we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Sinners with an eternal soul. Sinners made in the image of God. Hold on. That person that you're mad at was made in the image of God as well. That person who, who just goes out of their way to take all of their trash and dump it on you, that person was also made in the image of God. No, you're saying, no, 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 you're confused. They were made in the image of Satan. No, they were made in the image of God, but sin came in and took away our joy and our peace and our love. Sin in our life separates us from the holy God. But though God created us with an eternal soul and we were made in his image, he, we, we all long for life, but we're unable to get to heaven on our own. We're unable to get to God on our own. So he sent Jesus to bridge that gap. In Hebrews 9, it says, Is it appointed unto man once to die? But after that, the judgment. God doesn't want you separated from him. Church, please hear this. God wants to spend all of eternity showing you his love. God wants to spend all of eternity making you beyond ecstatic. God wants to spend all of eternity not to create any deficit in heaven because the, the love of God that is in heaven has an endless source to it. But he just wants to pour it on you and pour it on you and pour it on you. And whether you think that, you, I, I want you to know you are special. I want you to know you are the apple of his eye. But that those other people that you don't like, he loves just the same way. John 15, verse 13 says this, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life 
for his friends. Aren't you grateful God did that for us? Are you willing to do that for someone else? Are y'all okay with loving your enemies? Are you, are you okay with loving them the way God loved you? Isn't that, is that part of Scripture, love your enemies? Pray for those who abuse you? If John 3.16 expresses God's love, if this love flowed out of God's heart because of the preciousness of each lost soul, and he sees all of those people in humanity that have been made in the image of God, but they've been marred by sin. But yet, with Christ, he wants them not to be seen in sin. He wants them to be seen by the pureness of his Son. You know what God sees when he sees old? I, can, I almost put a bunch of adjectives in front of my name, but I better leave them out today. You know what God sees when he sees Brian? He sees the perfection of Jesus. Christ in me, the hope of glory. I used to wonder when I was a kid, how many of y'all ever had an old King James Bible? I preach at a new King James, but just about most of the scripture I have memorized, I've had memorized for a long time, and, and I, most of it I memorized in the King James Version. And, and there, but there was a word in there I never liked. It was a translation of the word. The word was the same word it had always been. It was agape. And it was, in my new King James, it's translated love. But in the old King James, it used the word charity. Y'all remember that? I never liked that. Because, you see, when I think of the word charity today, it's not agape. Laura had a friend, and they did a yard sale for a friend. By the way, that was love. And I don't know how much time she put into it, but some of the church people came and helped her yesterday. They got up before the sun, and they got it all lined up here, and, and, and they had all these things that had been donated, and they were going to sell them to somebody else. Um, and so this person could have some needed funds. Good thing. But you know what people gave? All the things in their house that they didn't want, they didn't need, they had had so long they got tired of tripping over it. And they had, to buy, they had to make room for all the new stuff that they were going to get this Christmas. So they got all the clothes out of the closet that they couldn't fit into. There was a Christmas toy. I think it was there when I was about six years old. And it, amen. Doug donated a bunch of electrical stuff. I said, did you take all the fuses that don't work anymore and you're going to donate them and sell them to somebody else? We got talking about it. I said, I could have brought that chainsaw. I got a chainsaw. The only thing it's good for is to be a boat anchor. I mean, I guess you could take the chainsaw and do it like this against a tree and it might work. I loaned it to a friend and they were so good to put the wrong type of gas in it. No good deed goes unpunished, right? I mean, I could have I could have came and I could have brought that and somebody else could have said, you know, I can fix that. And I would have said, no, you can't. <laughs> Tried. But you know what people do is people bring all the stuff that they don't want and they give it away and they call it what? Charity. I need a tax write-off, so I, I, I've got to give a certain amount so I can get a so I can get back and receive more. So I'll give to charity. And that was my concept. So I'm reading the old King James, and they would put that word charity in there, and I'm like, no. Charity is for the people who aren't willing to do anything for themselves, who aren't willing to go to work or all that kind of stuff, because that was the concept of how I had seen how things got twisted by this world and, and the selfishness of us. We didn't give our best to others. We gave them the leftovers. 
but God didn't give leftovers. He didn't say, well, I got these few angels over here. They're not much good for anything, but if you want them, you can have them. I mean, I lost a third of them that were just about as selfish as could be. They smell like hell. That's where they're going. He didn't say, no, you can have that. He gave us the best. Is it okay if I say the very best? And no matter how long we're in heaven, we're going to have a greater understanding of how much he really did give for us. We can't sit in this room today and talk about how much we love God if we do not love one another. It's very plain. Scripture says this, John 13, verse 35. By this, all will know you are my disciples, that you belong to me. If you have love for one another. How often do we fall in the pit of judging someone else? How often do we just get tired of other people and not want to be around them? How often do we not even see people? We just overlook them. Oh, you're squirming now. How often do we treat people the way we would never want to be treated and feel justified by it? As a matter of fact, we could give you an excuse why that dirty, rotten scoundrel does not deserve my time or my attention. When was the last time you got mad at somebody and you may not have written them off, y'all hear me? But you just don't want to be around them anymore. You're not going to call them. You're not going to praise them. You're not going to pray for them. You're not going to do anything because I can't disbelieve what they did. And in our society today, you know what we do? We just take them like a wad of paper. And yet Christ came. Whew. Christ came. Now, I can't do what he did, but he'll unfold our junk. See, the thing that God can do that I can't do is he'll make it brand new. No wrinkles, no dirt, no grime. Brand new. So what we're supposed to see is not this. What we're supposed to see is the, say it, brand new. Say it again. Get your eyes off of the, the trash and put your eyes on Christ and watch what Christ does for the glory of God throughout all of eternity, that's love. That's love. 1 Peter 1.22 says this, Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, Love one another fervently with a pure heart. That means no hypocrisy. Just don't act like it. Let God create in you love like you've never known before. I was thinking about this last night. What it would be like if everybody treated everybody that way from their heart. What would it be like if nobody had a word of misunderstanding or, or a, a, a word of condemnation, a, a word? Do y'all know what I mean when I say somebody gives somebody a sideways compliment? 
you're complimenting them, but in a way you're kind of sticking a knife in them at the same time. It's kind of like, I love you even though, you know. What would it be like if everybody just loved? You know what that'd be called? You know, say it. Heaven. That'd be heaven. But the thing is, is that God gave us his spirit, so right now we have heaven on earth. If we choose it. 